Welcome to the Lentil Intervention Podcast, talking all things movement, whole food nutrition and environmental wellness with your hosts, Ben and Emma. Welcome everybody to episode 10 of the Lentil Intervention Podcast, a small milestone for us as we certainly didn't expect to get here so quickly, but thanks to your support and encouragement, our list of upcoming guests continues to grow, so we are not going anywhere. My name is Ben Adelberg, sitting in Auckland, New Zealand, and coming to you from Boona, Queensland, is my co-host, Emma Strutt. Hey Ben, hi folks, how are you going? Very good, thank you. So June is Bowel Cancer Awareness Month and Mm -hmm. uh, in both Australia and New Zealand. And um, our next guest is very timely. Absolutely. Um, She's a bit of a pro in this space. Uh, I'll just do a little bit of a preamble first to set things up, though. Um, Now, bowel cancer is also known as colorectal cancer. It's actually the third um, most common type of newly diagnosed cancer in Australia. Over 15,000 Aussies and over 3,000 Kiwis are diagnosed with bowel cancer each year. And unfortunately, over 5,000 die from it in Australia and over 1,200 in New Zealand. And it's actually the second deadliest cancer in Australia and New Zealand. And unfortunately, rates are on the rise. But the good news is 99% of bowel cancer cases can actually be treated successfully if found early. And when it comes to cancer in general, between 30 to 50% of all cancer cases are actually preventable, and we'll be getting into some of this today. Now, our guest today is the phenomenal lifestyle medicine practitioner, Robin Shooter, owner of Empower Total Health on the Gold Coast. I asked Robin to join us today because she's basically a walking encyclopedia when it comes to all things gut health. I honestly don't know anyone else that has the recall Robin does about certain, you know, bacterial and fungi strains and their effect on disease processes. So we're really in for a treat today. But just quickly before we bring Robin in, for the listeners, if this topic piques your interest and you want to find out a little bit more, please head to my website, so um, www.greenstuffnutrition.com and find the Plant Power Gut Challenge. I put this together last year. So the social media challenge side of things isn't running this year, but all the info is still relevant. It's a 60-plus page resource with plenty of info on gut health, whole food, plant-based nutrition, and it's also got a bunch of recipes from Australian and New Zealand leading health professionals and plant-based foodies, including some delicious recipes from you, Ben, as well as Robin, (laughs) Um, and that's a free download for anyone that wants it. And for those that uh, missed it, we have already put it up on our social media. Uh, So go to our Facebook page and we've also put it up um, or a link to it on our Instagram. So, yes, get yourself a free copy of that download. Fantastic. Okay, so enough of my rambling. (laughs) Let's bring Robin on. Thank you so, so much for joining us today and giving up some of your precious weekend time, Robin. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really pumped. I've been so enjoying your your podcast and I already have this huge roster of podcasts that I subscribe to, but I've slotted you in and it's worth every second. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robin. That's uh, it's good to know we have a, you know, a diehard listener. Um, (laughs) but no thank you so much that's very kind words from you and um, no we're absolutely delighted to have you you know celebrate our 10th show but um, more importantly as as Emma said um, you know you bring a wealth of knowledge and expertise in a in a very uh, sort of on a very important topic but before we get into that um, let's start off a little bit about yourself tell us a little bit about who you are what you do what you've studied and uh Of course, why plant-based? Wow. Well, that's so everything that you've just asked is so tightly interconnected, which probably won't surprise you. Mm -hmm. I first went, I I went vegetarian when I was 15 uh, on ethical grounds and I had no idea about the dairy industry or the egg production industry at that time. Um, uh, this this was the 1980s. It was must have been 80, 86, 87 when I went vegetarian. And so there was obviously no internet um, to learn anything about the topic. I had to go to the public library <laughs> and check out books. So there, just, there just wasn't a whole lot of information out there back yeah. then, nor was there a lot of support. And 
I actually, I, I freely admit that I made a complete hash of it. I was basically the world's worst vegetarian. I lived off Sara Lee uh, vegetable quiches <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and this rather disgusting stuff. I, I think it's still around. It was called um, Nuttaline. And it looked a bit like pal uh, oh, dog that's food. Stuff in that the is. Can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. I had not a clue about how to do this properly. And probably unsurprisingly, I did not enjoy good health as a consequence of my decision to go vegetarian. In fact, I, I gained weight and I had terrible skin. And kind of apropos of our topic today, and so apologies if this is TMI, but I had really ghastly constipation. <laughs> I mean, not not just, oh, you know, it's a little challenging to go to the bathroom, but excruciating pain kind of constipation. Mm. And that went on for several years. And I had not a clue what was happening and nor did any of the doctors that I, I, I saw about it which is really extraordinary. So I, I, I'll spare you the detail of all those gory bits, but fast forward a little. My, my father was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes when I was in my late teens, early 20s, and uh, that was... <sighs> I think that was lurking around it there in the background in terms of my decision to, to study naturopathy. So I did a, a, a four-year diploma of naturopathy and then started my practice at the age of, of 23 and then pretty rapidly figured out that I didn't know what I needed to know about actually getting getting people on board with a healthy lifestyle. So a mm. whole string of different qualifications followed that and you know, I managed to accumulate a graduate diploma of counselling and then a Bachelor of Health Science and then honours in that and, and so on and so forth. And, and then eventually when the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine announced that, that they were um, conducting board exams, I thought, well, yes, this is what I've been doing my, my whole professional career. This is lifestyle medicine. It's funny, but I didn't really know there was a word for what I'd been doing <laughs> in terms of not, not just teaching people how to eat better, but also to take care of their, their sleep and their fitness and their relationships with each other and, and with themselves. So I'm now very proud to be a fellow of the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine I have a lifestyle medicine practice here on the Gold Coast, and I I do have uh, I I do work with clients in Sydney as well, and and then online, and plant based nutrition is at the absolute core of of what I do, but these other elements of lifestyle medicine are hugely important to to me and to my practice as well. I just want to go back on one thing that you raised earlier. Um, you know, when you first went vegetarian. Um, thinking that, well, you know, dairy and, and eggs are fine, which, to be honest, was my same journey. And for a lot of people, you know, you think happy cows and, and free-range eggs are, are absolutely fine until, you know, you're better educated with... And nowadays it's a lot easier with documentaries and a lot of literature, social media, etc. But it also highlights, um, you know, when you say you were the world's worst vegetarian, I think a lot of our guests have all, have all come on the show saying they started off as the world's worst vegan or vegetarian because of what they ate. And it just goes to show the importance of what certainly the three of us, um, among, as well as so many others do, in trying to educate a lot of the general public in terms of eating a well-balanced whole food plant-based diet because just going vegan for the animals or doing it for the environment is not enough. You still need to look at what you eat. So I think that just highlights the the the, the importance that, um, yes, you have your right intentions, but it seems that people still need to be educated and shown the right way. Yeah. And, and I they, mean, good health is good advocacy, isn't it? Mm. Sorry to yes, I, I agree with that. No, no, no. Um, it, it's, it's a really good point, Emma, that – you know, if, if we're actually living, breathing examples of how health promoting this lifestyle is, people look at that and go, wow, that actually looks fun. That looks like something I would like to do. I think the other thing that's so important is that there isn't, you know, Michael Greger always makes a joke about there being no big broccoli. And that's true. <laughs> We've got all of these multinational corporations who are jumping on the vegan bandwagon now because it's trendy. And 
they do what multinational food corporations do is they produce a lot of hyper palatable ultra processed food that's very high profit but very low yield in terms of health benefits yeah. and you know we we as as health professionals as health practitioners really need to to be in a sense the 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 advocate for broccoli and lentils because they just don't have the the marketing department behind them the way that you know vegan cornettos do so We've brought you on because it is Bowel Cancer Awareness Month and gut health is kind of your baby. Um, so why don't we just start off by just talking generally about how important your gut actually is to many different disease processes. Yeah, it is such a fascinating topic. And you know me, Emma, I love to nerd out on stuff. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, the gut microbiota gives just such enormous scope for nerding out. It is an endlessly fascinating topic. I think it's probably even more interesting to me because of the explosion of knowledge in, in very recent years. When I mean, I was I went through naturopathic college in the late. Uh, let me sit. No, no, sorry. It was ninety one when I began my diploma of naturopathy, and there was so little known about the gut microbiota that in in four years, I learned almost almost nothing. I mean, there was this sort of vague notion that yes, the the gut flora, as they were called back then in the 90s, were really important to health, but no one really knew much of anything about who lived in there and why. And that's because at, at that point, we were very much confined to, to culturing techniques. So no, one, no scientist actually knew of the the majority of gut bacteria species back then because it wasn't until genomic sequencing came on the horizon that, that we're able to to figure out you know what actually was living in the human colon up until that point it was only known that oh there are a few lactobacilli and a few bifidobacteria because you can culture them from a stool sample you can actually grow them in a petri dish out outside the person's body but once these dna sequencing techniques became available suddenly you know, uh, gut microbiota research really came into its own because it was possible to determine the the vast array of species that actually live there. So I, I think many people are probably familiar with these numbers by now, but, it, but I, I still find it just mind-boggling to run through them. So we've got between 10 and 100 trillion microorganisms that comprise our, our microbiota, and most of them do, do live in the gut. Now, no one really agrees on how many human cells there are, you know, what the ratio is between human cells and microbiota. So I've, I've read in the literature, we've got anywhere between twice the number of, of bacteria as we have human cells, up to 10 times the number of bacteria compared to human cells. So anyway, there's more of them than, than there is of us. And co collectively, they, they weigh up to two kilos um, which, which is bigger than our brain. So the average human brain weighs about 1.3 to 1.4 kilos. You've actually got more bugs than brain, which is kind of startling, <laughs> very startling. There's at least 1,000 different species of gut bacteria, um, over 7,000 different strains that, that have been isolated in, in human beings across you know, all shapes and sizes and continents and diets and whatever. And then within any individual, you've got somewhere around 150 that predominate um, in, in that individual. And I, the thing that I find absolutely gobsmackingly fascinating above all else is that the profile of gut bacteria that you have is completely unique to you. It's as unique as your fingerprint. Even identical twins have different gut microbiota. So it's, it's, you know, we start out with the same, I mean, say in the case of identical twins, they're growing in the same womb, they're, they're, if they're breastfed or bottle fed for that matter, they're fed the same, the same food uh, from the same mother or the same source. And yet their gut microbiota diverge until by the age of three, they're, they're actually distinct from each other. And distinct from everyone else on earth. So it's, and, and then the, the, the number of roles that these gut microbiota play, it's 
absolutely mind bending. They train our immune system. They're actually responsible for forming the the gut associated lymphoid tissue in so the you know the the actual um, immune system tissue that's in the gut. They're they're responsible for forming regions of our brain like the hippocampus. They're they're you know communicating um, directly and indirectly with with our central nervous system um, through producing neurotransmitters and also modulating the the production of neurotransmitters in in the enteric nervous system in the gut brain i mean what whatever function you can think of they're involved in it <laughs> it's it's yeah and, and and we've we have known so little about this until relatively recently yeah yeah on those, um, on those species, um, so you said that everyone's got their own unique fingerprint, but you can kind of broadly classify them into two categories, can't you? So the Predatella and the Bacteroides. Yes. Yes, this and, and, and that in itself is really fascinating, isn't it? That despite this huge diversity, just at a at a, a, a kind of um, sixty four thousand foot view level, you can actually group people um, into these Prevotella enter uh, Prevotella dominant enterotypes and and Bacteroides dominant enterotype, and and that is the the biggest influence on that is diet. So people who eat that that typical Western diet that's you know high in animal protein, high in fat, and refined carbohydrates end up with this bacteroides dominated enterotype. And then people who are eating more more plants, more carbohydrates, especially unrefined carbohydrates, end up with this Prevotella dominant enterotype. Yeah, and and I mean your diet can begin to shift your microbiome pretty quickly, can't it? Yes. Well, as as you and I know, there was that fascinating study that was published. I think it was um was it two thousand where they took these volunteers and put them first on an exclusively animal food diet, so nothing but cheese and meat and and you know dairy products, so no fiber basically for for five days, and then did a washout period where they fed them normally and then put them on an entirely plant based diet. And they like that they, they took stool samples. The researchers took stool samples on a daily basis um, throughout this entire experiment, and found that basically on day two of feeding people with with these different diets, there were already significant shifts in the composition of gut bacteria. Probably even more importantly, there were very, very significant shifts in the gene expression of these bacteria. Now, it, it makes sense, of course, that the, the gene expression would shift because what the bacteria are there for is to, to a large extent, um, assist us with digestion, particularly of the components of, of carbohydrates from plants that humans can't digest. So the fiber, the resistant starch, the complex sugars, all the things that we don't have the digestive enzymes for because the human genome codes for 17 different carbohydrate digesting enzymes, which sounds pretty impressive, but it isn't that much because the, the gut bugs can code for over 7,000 carbohydrate digesting enzymes. So you know, wow. uh, so yeah, it's absolutely extraordinary. So the way that I, I, I suppose I think about it is that in the name of efficiency, humans or pre-humans or proto-humans actually outsourced carbohydrate digestion to to bacteria. So yeah, it makes total sense that you're going to see this massive change in, in gene expression when people say go 100% plant-based because now you need to, you th those bacteria are going to be turning on genes that that allow them to make use of the, the carbohydrates that are now ending up in the colon. But I guess the really scary feature of the animal-based diet is that what, what happened in that case was that within a couple of days, there was a, a bloom in bacterial species that metabolized bile, bile acids, and they produce these compounds called secondary bile acids and relevant to our, our topic today of, of, of bowel cancer is these secondary bile acids that have been found to uh, basically damage the, the cells lining the colon and essentially sow the seeds for, for a cancer to develop. Yeah. So yeah. in the, the era where carnivore diets are becoming really, really popular, I am frankly terrified of 
what's sort of <laughs> pardon the pun coming down the pipe within you know uh, within I would say a relatively short period of time um you know, 10 to 15 years would, would be my rough guess anyone following a, an exclusive animal product based diet is is very very likely to be developing colorectal cancer yeah and and normally of course like it historically colorectal cancer has been an old person's disease you know people would get diagnosed um in their 60s in their 70s maybe at worst in their late 50s and i've now seen two clients diagnosed with with uh colorectal cancer below the age of 40 One, one was in her late 20s just terrifying. Old person's disease is happening in in, in young people. So yeah, the um, the the what what we eat doesn't just nourish us. It basically determines who's going to live down there in our colon. And if we're harboring these bacteria that that produce these really toxic substances like secondary bile acids, we're we're sowing the seeds of of, of our own destruction. When, when you talk about statistics, um, we're already seeing, um, I know for New Zealand, uh, uh, and, and Emma, you might, you might be able to contribute for Australia, but we're already seeing 10% at least um, under the age of 50 are being diagnosed with bowel cancer. And I think that's, that's happening across a lot of other forms of cancer as well. But that is scary when, when you say, you know, when, when people are following particular diets, um, that's uh, such as, you know, the carnivorous diet, which is more extreme, but even the keto, high-fat, low-carb diets, that's potentially accelerating uh, the problem here. You are 100% right. And again, on a, on a ketogenic diet, by definition, you're you're getting the vast majority of your calories from fat. Well, when you eat fat, your gallbladder contracts and expels bile into the small intestine. And, and you know, bile's there to metabolize your fat so you can absorb your fat-soluble vitamins, which is all well and good. But the more fat you eat, the more bile is being pumped out. And that means more bile is going to land down there in the colon. And that means you end up with a much larger population of these bile-tolerant uh, microorganisms. Uh, there, there are two in particular. There's, there's uh, Bilophila wadsworthia, um, which, as the name implies, you know, bi- uh, bilophilic, it loves bile. And then there's this whole family of, of bile munching bacteria called Desulfa vibrio. And high uh, counts of, of these bacteria have been found in the colons of people who eat a high fat diet. And there, the increased prevalence of these bacteria is, is, is linked not just to a high risk of, of colorectal cancer. They're also seriously involved in ulcerative colitis, which is another condition that, that you know, I'm, I'm seeing so much more of. And, but with both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, you know, people who suffer these, these inflammatory bowel diseases, they're at heightened risk of, of colorectal cancer too. And that's largely because, obviously, with inflammatory bowel disease, hey, it's inflammatory, right? Any inflammatory condition, any chronic inflammatory condition increases the risk of cancer. But you can't help wondering, can you, uh, whether the the fact that they developed inflammatory bowel disease in the first place is is very strongly related to to dietary factors and these same dietary factors are those that we know are linked to an increased risk of colorectal cancer namely a high intake of animal products and an inadequate intake of plant foods especially high fiber plant foods Mm. yeah and on that with the animal products specifically let's just have a really quick chat about processed meats and red meat so oh yes (laughs) <laughs> oh my goodness and what is this bacon craze honestly <laughs> um, so look with with processed meats it, it's it's this complete disaster zone isn't it because they're high in fat they're preserved with with nitrites that are converted into nitrosamines that are known carcinogens they're say in in, in the case of the likes of bacon and ham they're also high in heme iron which is you know, no, which is a very strongly suspected risk factor for for colorectal cancer as well. It's it's kind of hard to imagine 
how if you were if you were some evil genius who wanted to concoct the perfect food for for causing colorectal cancer uh, it'd be hard to figure out how to come up with a better combination than that. I suppose if if if, if you had, um, you know, like a processed meat that also was smoking a cigarette at the same time, you could pretty much <laughs> nail it. <laughs> with a glass of whiskey <laughs> in like your other on- hand. <laughs> That's the only improvement I could think of to, to its carcinogenic potential. And so, you know, the World Health Organization comes out a couple of years ago and declares processed meat a, a, um, a group one carcinogen, a known, a proven human carcinogen. And what happens? You know, do we get warning labels slapped on, on packets of bacon? You know, do, do school canteens and hospitals stop serving processed meat because now we know it's a, it's a group one carcinogen? No, none of that happened. You can't smoke in hospitals or schools, and thank God for that. You know, cigarettes are, are, are a group one carcinogen, but hospitals can serve bacon and ham, and, and school canteens can can dish up, you know, processed meats to, to children. And so, oh, my goodness, what are we doing? But, Robin, the other problem as well is, um, you know, for the general public, who actually follows the World Health Organization in terms of getting updates or reading reports or anything like that. So that might make the news, and it will make the news, but then a week later, that same news outlet, whether it's a breakfast show um, or a newspaper, will then have a, an article that will counter those those claims and say, no, actually it's fine. And, and, and From you're okay one to- specific small study. Correct, or, or not even studies, <laughs> not even studies sometimes, and that's and it's not just you know when we're talking about carcinogenic meats, we're talking about you know how many glasses of wine is good for you if at all, and whether plant based, you know it's that's the problem, it's the misinformation that also does not allow to drive the change that we need. Correct, and that misinformation is is not random. That misinformation is is deliberately planted. So when you talk about you know newspapers first of all running the WHO study, and then running some study that that runs counter to it, that wasn't just like a bacon enthusiast that 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 pitched that study to the newspaper or the TV channel or whatever it was. What you're looking at is is organised industry lobby groups and they get their message into the media you know because of their lobbying power because they've got the dollars behind them mm. and unfortunately you know these companies have actually learned from what happened to the cigarette companies they've they've learned how how not to fall into the same trap that resulted in the cigarette companies basically having to own up to the fact that their products were killing people and 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 then you know, pay um, pay compensation to them and accept all of these restrictions on their marketing practices. So, so yeah, there there are no such restrictions on the marketing of of, of bacon or or you know a, any other food that's that's known to be a um, a, a carcinogen. Yeah. Yeah, and and you're right. The public are terribly confused, and let's face it. I mean, people love eating their bacon. So if they see a, if they see a, a, a um, an item on the news that says, "Hey, WHO says bacon is carcinogenic," and then the next day or the next week they see a study that says, "No," or they see a they see an, a news item that says, "No, no, no, it's fine. You know, um, don't worry about it." They're very happy to hear that news, as mm. Dr. John McDougall is fond of saying. People love to hear good news about their bad habits. <laughs> But even even our own dietary guidelines and many of the dietary guidelines around the world, there's a there's an industry influence in those as well, isn't there? There absolutely is, and you know this only too well, Emma. Um, a major avenue of employment for for people who graduate dietetics is the food industry, and so you've you've got you know qualified dietitians who are actually the spokespeople for these for these food um, organisations and, and for the, the peak marketing bodies of these organisations. I, I don't know how you feel about that. I, I can't hmm. imagine it. it. It's a good feeling. It was a bit of a challenge getting through my degree, to be honest, knowing what I already knew, but anyway. Oh, could <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet. But, Robin, um, you know, sorry, we, we talk about, um, you know, the, the risk factors of well, especially the bacons, the hams, the processed meats, but and, and the carcinogenic effects of, of, of meat itself and even the way meat is cooked to some degree. 
But what about mm. the processed foods? And, and this is a dangerous territory to go down, though. But the, the processed foods in the, in the vegan aisle, which are replicating the yes. meats, the bacons, the, the chickens, the, 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 you know, your beef patties, all that kind of stuff. But the way they prepared, what they contain as ingredients, and even the way they cook, that they can still contain a lot of the harmful substances that you mentioned are contained in, in meat directly. You are 100% correct, and I am really very concerned about the long-term uh, health outcomes of people who are eating the, the likes of these plant-based meat analogues. Um, some of them on the market contain pretty much as much uh, total fat. There's, there's one in particular that contains even more saturated fat mm -hmm. than an equivalent-sized beef patty because of the use of coconut oil. They're, uh, you know, one of them, um, what is it, it's the Impossible Burger, has developed a, a process for generating heme iron from soybeans. And so they're, they're putting saturated fats and heme iron into these plant-based meat analogues. And they're, they're doing that, of course, to, to replicate the mouthfeel, to replicate the, the sensory properties of, of the animal products that people are accustomed to. And... I, I I know that you know the majority of, of people running these companies are actually very ethically motivated and their whole idea is look you know we just want to get the meat eaters away from from eating meat from an animal and so we're we're producing this plant-based meat analog to to give them what they love without all the all the all the harm certainly not the uh, the, the environmental harm and, and the harm to the animal and that and that's fine that's great I, I'm all for it the problem is the animal actually eats Eating the burger is, is not going to come out of this this whole mm. enterprise quite so well, because if they're eating this high saturated fat, uh, high total fat, high saturated fat product that also contains heme iron, and by the way, these plant based meat analogs have next to no fiber, so they are basically a um, an amalgamation, I suppose you could say, of all of these really highly processed components of plant foods, you know, various isolated proteins and then yeah. isolated fats and all these other components to, to give it taste and texture and, the, you know, that, that um, aroma when you, when you put it on the grill and whatever else have you. But the, the, the health benefits of products like that, very, very dubious. It's, I, I would say it's dubious that, that they have any health benefits at all, you know, compared right. to just eating the beef. And that's such an important fact, isn't it? Because, like, going back 10, 20 years, if you were a vegan, you probably had to be basically following a whole food plant-based diet by default because there were these, they weren't these options. People called it and, being vegan then hard yeah. because of that. Yeah. And, I mean, if yeah. you have a look at the stats at the moment, um, the Epic Oxford study, for example, it showed a 19% reduced risk for all cancers in vegans. Um, yeah. I reckon we're going to start seeing a change in the science coming out, um, mm. just generally speaking for the health of vegans, now that these kinds of foods are starting to be more uh, dominant in the diets. Which to that then can also start questioning some people's rationale for going vegan because yeah, we're absolutely. selling the message that vegan yes it's great for the environment yes it's great for the animal welfare but it's good for your health game changes it's good for your health even though the game changes had some flaws in there because if you looked at what some of those top performing athletes were eating the fake meat patties and so on and like emma said if, if, the, if the, the, the the science and the research is now going to start showing a direct correlation with more processed foods um, in the vegan sort of uh, uh, world and an increase in health effects, then, well, why do I want to go vegan? Absolutely. And this is such a factor given that so many people, especially younger people, they're going vegan because of their consumption of social media. And so, you know, some 14 or 15 year old girl or some some young guy who wants to be all ripped and have a six pack and all the rest of it. He's scrolling through his social media feed and he sees, you know, some some dude or some guy, uh, some girl who's who's gone vegan and says, oh, it's, it's so wonderful. It's all this and that and the other. And then 
you know, if that person develops health problems, if they say, oh, no, I went vegan and I gained weight or I or my skin broke out or whatever, you know, whatever other other um, effects that's relevant to, to that particular person might occur. And then the whole the whole notion of going vegan gets tarred with that same brush. So rather than being able to distinguish between a healthy plant based diet versus, you know, a vegan, a, a vegan junk food diet young impressionable people who might be open to veganism are liable to being turned off it and if if either they or someone that they're following has a negative health outcome because of that you may well kind of poison that person against ever trying it again and that's really really unfortunate so there's there's a lot of work to be done by by those of us in this space to to I don't know I mean <laughs> we, we've got to make it sexy too <laughs> That's a hard as sell, well as it? just <laughs> it is a hard sell you know it is it is you need um, to bring Popeye back and... eating his cans of spinach <laughs> <laughs> that's right well he he managed to impress olive oil right I mean she was she yeah. She she was pretty into into the old Popeye once he'd uh, down that can of spinach. Although canned spinach, what even is I know spinach? Look, that's, that's <laughs> canned asparagus. Let's let's go there, or I don't know <laughs> canned peas. <laughs> yeah, so no, there there is there is a world of difference between these ultra processed, hyper palatable vegan versions of the junk you used to eat before you went vegan mm. versus these whole plant foods. And that that difference really does come down to what what is left over after humans after the human digestive tract has, has had its way um, with with the food that we eat. So, you know, if you look at what actually, what, what are the factors in food that are most uh, most predictive of having a really you know, healthy, robust, and diverse gut microbiota, it's it's whole plant foods. It's the 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 quantity of whole plant foods that you're eating, and it's also the diversity. The American Gut Project, which I, I'm just so absolutely blown away by what they've managed to do. Actually, it's, it's Rob Knight's a Kiwi. The guy who heads this this whole operation up is a Kiwi. So Ben, you know, be <laughs> proud. One of New Zealand's finest. So so Rob Knight uh, got together this this um, essentially a consortium of of scientists who were involved in gut microbiota research and started this American Gut Project and. Um, it doesn't just run in America. You, you can actually send a, a, a sample of your gut bacteria. I'll leave it to your imagination about how that sample is gathered because, you know, we might, we might, we need to keep this family friendly. Don't know how customs um, deals with it. Your... <laughs> I'm assuming it flies business class. Boom, boom. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a dad joke. Um, so you can send your 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 sample off to them um, at the American Gut Project, and they will basically analyze your sample and see who's who in your particular microbial zoo. And then they also get people to fill out really really detailed questionnaires about what they eat and when's the last time they took antibiotics and do they exercise and do they do it indoors and outdoors and all this sort of stuff. And then they use um, basically they use big data techniques to 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 crunch all of these numbers and to develop um, correlations be, between people's gut microbiota and what they do in their lives. And it turns out that the single factor that is most predictive of gut microbiota diversity is the number of different whole plant foods that people eat in a week. And the number that they came up with was was 30. So if you eat 30 or more different whole plant foods in a week, congratulations, you are going to be in that um, stratum of participants in the American uh, Gut Project uh, that that have the healthiest and most diverse gut microbiota. And that's yeah. that's super important because most of us tend to get into a bit of a rut. You know, we eat same veg, yeah. same fruit. You know, we have our favourite beans or our favourite grains. I was going to say, We're 30, 30 of, is actually you know. quite a challenge because speaking for myself, when you cook, when you, when you, you know, you live on your own and you cook for yourself and you cook a batch, a big pot of soup or whatever, and that lasts five, six days, um, you know, that's that's the same what's in that dish. So that's one meal already. You're having the same thing every day. So 30 variety is, is, is a challenge. You've got to really start planning. Yeah. 
I I actually just for fun I did a count on what I eat uh, to see you know whether whether I got to that I got to thirty different foods in two days. <laughs> but I'm actually writing it down then. now. <laughs> Yeah, write it down. It's kind of fun. Well, I I usually eat, you know, three or four sometimes. No, nah, actually, it's probably closer to five different types of fruit in a day. I don't necessarily eat, you know, five whole pieces of fruit. But when I'm when, when either my husband or myself are making breakfast, we just kind of cut the fruit up and, and, and distribute it amongst the family members. And so I usually eat five different kinds of fruit. Um, uh, most most of them at breakfast, and then I've got my oats, and then I I'm, I'm a, I, I love spices, and each spice actually counts as a different oh, food. Boom, I've done it so in two I days. Add cinnamon. <laughs> yeah, you you sort of there on that one, Ben. You're probably going to be fine because yeah. I put cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg. And all spice. Oh, and cardamom. Yep. That's yep. five. I actually put five spices on my on my oats. So yeah. so I'm 10, 11. Like I'm but by the time I, I I also a lot of people think this is really weird, but I actually add frozen chopped spinach or or kale to my oats as well. So I'm I'm generally at about fifteen uh, just in breakfast alone. And 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 it's it, it's not hard. I, I tend to eat the same breakfast every day, although I do vary the fruits. But but you know, by the time I have a salad that has you know six or seven different vegetables in it, and then you know either rice or quinoa or beans, I'm generally you know pushing 25 just by the end of one day. And then even if you did make a batch of soup and eat the same soup, you know, several days running, well, if you've got a couple of different types of legumes in there and then you've got, you know, half a dozen different veggies, you can still manage to to get really significant variety um, even if you're doing the batch cooking thing. And I'm such a fan of batch cooking. It's an awesome strategy. And it just goes to show the, well. the importance of spices as well because, you know, if that counts and I'm, I'm a huge fan of spices, the, the antioxidant potency and all the other good stuff. But, you oh, know, yeah. when, when you really in, in, involve a, or include a, a wide variety of spices, which we should, you know, it's good flavor and brings beautiful color to the dish as well. Well, there we go. So my 30, I've done it. Whew. But I'm <laughs> let's, let's just really quickly, if you don't mind, Robin, have a quick chat about the FODMAP diet because that's become a really hot topic in the gut world um, and it's quite a restrictive diet. Um, what, what are your thoughts on the FODMAP diet and um, where, where should it be used, if at all? Yes. It, it is extremely popular, isn't it? And unfortunately, with with that popularity has come quite a degree of misapplication of it. Mm. And yeah. so, you know, if you if you take a look at Monash Uni's, um, you know, FODMAP pages on on on, on like the yeah you know, the the web page that they have set up for it, what they recommend is that people only do the very strict version of the FODMAP diet for, for a maximum of, of four weeks. So they recommend two to four weeks. And I, I don't use the low FODMAP diet terribly often. I, I do use it with, with people who, who have irritable bowel syndrome that hasn't responded to, I suppose, you know, some of the more obvious dietary tweaks like getting rid of dairy, for instance. Mm -hmm. So if, if we've rounded up the usual suspects and they're still having IBS, I, I will kind of judiciously apply the low FODMAP diet at times. But they're only supposed to stay on it for, for a pretty short period of time. And then once the symptoms settle down, uh, you add foods back. And the idea is is to sort of um, determine the threshold at which, uh, like above which a person can't, you know, uh, can't really manage a food or has very uncomfortable symptoms that interfere with their quality of life. And it, it turns out that for the majority of people who do actually have some kind of bowel condition that's fog that, that is FODMAPs um, um, responsive, it's really only one or two of those categories of high FODMAPs foods that, that give them any trouble at all. And the rest of them they can bring back in and, and, and they're, they're going to be absolutely fine. Um, Monash's own research, by the way, has has shown, and, and, and they, you know, they don't hide this, it's right there on their website. It's actually shown that, that the diversity of, of gut microbiota drops significantly within two weeks of following a low FODMAPs diet, um, to which I I would say, duh, you know, FODMAPs are fermentable carbohydrates. Well, what do 
our good gut bacteria eat? Fermentable carbohydrates, of course. <laughs> That's you know the, the the it's the carbohydrates that humans can't digest that end up down in the colon where they get fermented by our beneficial gut bacteria. Like that's how the system works. And so when I see people, and this is not uncommon, I see people who've been put on a low FODMAPS diet, often by a gastroenterologist, uh, sometimes by a, t- by a dietitian, and, and very often they've just self-prescribed it. They've just diagnosed themselves with IBS and they've, mm. you know, followed a low FODMAPS diet and they've, you know, read a book on it or downloaded the Monash app or whatever have you. And they've been eating low FODMAPs for, for you know, in some the worst case I can think of. She'd been on it for six years. Oh and, yeah, needless to say, of course, by, by that time, you know, after six years without fermentable carbohydrates, her gut microbiota were in such a sorry state that, that if she did eat a, a food that was high in FODMAPs, she was absolutely like curled up on the couch with the most horrible bloating and gas because her, her gut bacteria have basically, you know, lost the, the capacity to handle these carbohydrates. And so reintroducing higher FODMAPs foods to, to these people who've been, you know, over-enthusiastically limiting them for a long time, it's, a, it's actually quite a challenge. It's a really long, drawn-out process. So, uh, yeah, definitely to be used with extreme caution and for the shortest possible period of time. And I guess really the bottom line for me is that the, the low FODMAPs diet is, is symptom management, it's most definitely not addressing the cause of that person's IBS. You know, no one develops IBS because they ate too many high FODMAPs foods. They develop IBS because they have some other condition going on that has increased their sensitivity to the production of gas by bacteria through normal healthy fermentation processes in their gut. And it's that underlying condition that that needs to be corrected, not just putting them on a low FODMAP diet and leaving them on that forever because they're going to end up in serious trouble, um, including potentially a heightened risk of colorectal cancer because they're not eating enough of the foods that feed the good bacteria that protect them against these diseases. Shall we talk a little bit about the, um, I guess, the trend of uh, supplementation, prebiotics, probiotics? You know, people think, well, you know, I need to improve the, the microbiome in my gut and these are good for you. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts around that? Oh boy, so glad you <laughs> asked. There, there, there is a really fundamental misunderstanding uh, about probiotics that I, I can probably summarize uh, with, with you know, one sentence, which is people have bought into the notion that taking a probiotic supplement will essentially recolonize their gut with with healthy bacteria. And that is a complete nonsense. It's an utter nonsense. The vast majority of probiotics, and and sorry, just just to define our terms here, uh, the probiotics are the the bacteria. I mean, the if, if you go for the strictest definition of a probiotic, it's a a genotyped species of bacteria that has been shown in a clinical trial on humans to bring about some defined health benefit if it's administered in a high enough dose. Okay, so that's the official definition of a probiotic. Now, the vast majority of probiotic products on the market contain strains that are actually not native to to the human microbiome. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're useless, but it does mean that they don't colonize. They don't become permanent residents. So on their way through, they can exert some some pretty powerful uh, effects, and, and that can be enormously beneficial. And there are, there are some pretty good quality clinical trials on the effects of, of various uh, uh, different probiotic strains for, for particular conditions. But if you take stool samples of of people um, who've been taking probiotics, those, those stool samples, while they're still taking the probiotic, they will actually show that the probiotic is, is present in their stool, which stands to reason. But if you do another stool sample a week or two after they finish taking the product, there's very rarely, if ever, 
any detectable uh, levels of that bacteria still left. And what that means is these bacteria don't colonise. They don't become permanent residents. They were just passing so through. Whether, Excuse the pun. They were just passing through. <laughs> Absolutely. They yeah. were They were indeed. They, 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 they kind of checked out the neighbourhood, shook hands with the, with the neighbours and then went straight on through and down the toilet bowl. So does <laughs> so, that include so, so, things like yoghurt and kefir and, and these kind of um, foods? Functional foods. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, it does. It does. They 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 don't colonize. They don't colonize. I mean, look, there is definitely interest in developing probiotic products uh, that contain human native strains. Um, strains like Fecalobacterium prausnitzi and, and Acomansia mucinophila, which are really really key players in a, a healthy human gut um, microbiota. But no one's been able to actually develop probiotic products that contain these because they're they're they're, they're anaerobic. They're obligate anaerobes. You can't grow them outside the colon. As soon as you expose them to oxygen, they snuff it. So no one's figured out how to do that yet. Uh, there is a lot of interest in, in fecal microbial transplants, um, <laughs> taking other people's poo either as as an enema, um, which sounds like a lot of fun, or as what uh, what Tom Barodi, um, who's a really a pioneering gastroenterologist, he, he calls them crapsules. <laughs> which I think is pretty funny. Um, so they, they are looking at developing these these probiotic crapsules where you can actually take gut microbiota from, from a healthy person's gut and, 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 and re-inoculate a person whose gut microbiota has been decimated by antibiotics or it just is in a really, really unhealthy state. Uh, but that's... That's still, that's still, you know, that's not on any kind of close time horizon. That's very much in the future. So what we've got currently is is probiotics that are mostly comprised of lactobacilli and bifidobacteria. Uh, like th- those are the probiotic products that you're going to be able to find in the health food store or the or the, um, or the pharmacy. And in in an adult gut, uh, bifidobacteria make up around about four percent. Of the total gut microbiota and in the case of lactobacilli it's less than one percent so it, again you know the, the notion that you can recolonize your gut with these probiotic products is is absolutely nonsense you you can't same goes for, for your kombucha and your kefir and so forth um any of these fermented products they 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 don't colonize the gut and i was just going to ask what are your thoughts on the foods that have added prebiotics so not the actual whole foods but you know you can get these bars now that promote um the fact that they're prebiotic because they have um added chicory root or added inulin yeah well uh, as as we all know the best prebiotics are found in these whole foods you know that's why you find such healthy diverse gut microbiota in in people who eat a, a whole food plant-based diet um, is it better to to consume a, a prebiotic? Like, is that a more sensible strategy for the average person to promote gut health than taking probiotics? I would say it is, but again, I think it's a distraction. When when people are eating some bar that contains, again, you know, some some sort of refined sugar and some refined fats and um, you know, so, some other fractionated foods, but but it's got a health halo on it because it's got inulin or chicory root or God only knows what else. Um, you know that I, I would say that person is really kidding themselves that they're, they're making a big difference to their overall gut health. It's it's sure as heck better than buying a you know chocolate coated muesli bar. But I don't know. Again, I'm I'm reminded of of Michael Greger's joke. You know, w- w- would you rather be be you know shot or stabbed? It's like well, <laughs> neither actually. <laughs> it just goes to show that's the whole supplementation market as a whole. You know, it's 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 yeah. it's a money making. Um, sort of enterprise as opposed to offering a real benefit and unfortunately most people fall for it with fancy packaging fancy marketing um, you know a celebrity that promotes the product whatever the case is um, it's yes. just it's just just like multivitamins or just like a lot of other um, you know there's no real science uh, that shows the huge benefit of we need to take that um, it's just it's just not there and I think the most dangerous part of this too, and and what you just said about multivitamins, then is is another example of this, is that essentially it's a permission slip for people to eat poorly. 
Mm. So someone who buys one of these bars that, that is promoted as being prebiotic then has essentially a moral license, as it's termed in the behaviour change literature. They have this moral license to go and eat a big bunch of crap for the rest of the day because it's like, well, I ate my prebiotics in my bar, so I'm good now. I can go and eat my vegan Cornetto. So whenever you whenever you issue that moral license to a person, they're, they're liable to make make worse choices because they feel like they've done this this good thing and now they're free to go and you know do yeah. lots of bad things. Now you mentioned the <laughs> ill effects of antibiotics. Um, talk to us a little bit about the um, the effects of that because you know, growing up, um, I used to be a very sick child when I was very young. And um, I always remember if I was on antibiotics, what would my mum go and buy? Buy some yogurt to counter the effects of antibiotics. Now we've spoken about yogurt. Let's talk a little bit about antibiotics. Oh, yes. That's just brought back some some lovely memories for me too, Ben. The, the GP that that um, my mother always sent me to when I was a kid, it was one of those ones where pretty much – I think this guy, as soon as he saw walking in through his door a mother with a child, the hand was already on the prescription pad writing a, <laughs> writing a prescription for a Moxil. So I have no idea how many courses of antibiotics I had as a child, but, but it is truly frightening. So what we know about antibiotics is that uh, the younger that they're given in life, the more destructive they are. So there's some really interesting research. It actually came out of out of New Zealand. There's there's a great um, great research team based at, at the University of Auckland, and they there's a there's a cohort of, of kids born in the greater Auckland area whom, whom they've been following up on for you know I think this this study's been going on for over 10 years so long story short kids who received an antibiotic prescription in the first year of life are substantially more likely to become overweight or obese in childhood than kids who who did not receive their first um, antibiotic prescription at such a young age so that the, the gut microbiota is is in a really kind of fragile state between birth and the first year of life and, and really it, it doesn't it doesn't coalesce into its fully adult form until around three years of age so the earlier in life we give antibiotics the worse the effect that they have later on in life the effect of them is, is still very dramatic though and so what what is what is known from the literature is that a five day course of a broad spectrum antibiotic will reduce the the total number of gut bacteria by by thirty percent. Now that that number of gut bacteria will rebound back up again about a month after you finish that course of antibiotics. But the thing is, some bacteria that live in your gut are better at producing antibiotic resistance genes than others. And generally, it's the, the bacteroides and the proteobacteria that are able to hustle and get those antibiotic resistant genes expressed earlier than the the bacteria like the, the, the those in the, in the prebatella camp that are you know most most critical for human health so although the total count of bacteria looks pretty much the same you know a month after you finished your antibiotics the composition of those bacteria is altered now bacteroides uh, so, so just just to sort of categorise the bugs that live in your gut in, in broad terms, you've got the the symbiotic bacteria or commensals that that uh, do good things for you, right? They they take the carbohydrates that you can't digest, they ferment them into short chain fatty acids. They they're generally very very well behaved citizens of of the universe of your gut. And then you've got um, then, then you've got the pathogens, the just flat out nasty ones, the ones that you just don't want to have any of all. You know these really uh, uh, highly disease producing variants of E. coli, for instance. And then you've got this group in the middle called called the pathobionts, and they they can they can kind of go either way. It all depends on numbers. And and bacteroides actually fall into that camp. So if if you've if you if your good bacteria are kind of keeping the bacteroides under control, they'll be well behaved little citizens and they will participate in digesting your food and and, and all's well. 
But if you if you knock out the beneficial bacteria and the bacteroides get a chance to to overgrow, which which they will because bacteria are highly competitive with each other and um in in the event that the that that the numbers of, of gut bacteria are knocked down as they are by antibiotics, the ones that are able to to replicate the fastest are going to have this huge advantage. They basically take over the real estate, and now they start getting pretty out of control. So you end up with this more bacteroides and proteobacteria dominated ecosystem in the gut, and this leads to this whole cascade of changes. So, so uh, that includes, for instance, an increase in pH. So the gut actually becomes more alkaline when you've got uh, fewer of the beneficial bacteria, and that's a bad thing because it's acid that actually keeps the nasty bacteria and the pathogenic species of fungi like like the you know like like your candida albicans your thrush organism acidity keeps them under control so when the ph of the gut increases you get these massive changes in the composition of the gut and then you end up with motility changes as well so uh, people can experience for example diarrhea associated with with antibiotic use and very often, uh, people do de- do develop IBS after they've had a, a course of antibiotics because their gut motility is just completely screwed up uh, because of these changes that that occur in their um, composition of the gut microbiota because of the antibiotics. And uh, of course, you know that's the effect of a single course of antibiotics. So what happens when a person is on multiple courses of them? What happens when they're on you know five, six, you know ten courses of antibiotics one after the other? Um, it, it's absolutely catastrophic what that does. And in particular, species that 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 are quite marginal. So so uh, species where there's only maybe a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand individual bacteria in that species, they can be completely wiped out by antibiotics. Mm-hmm. And the the consequences of that, I mean, you know, what one of the one of the most striking ones is um a bacteria called Oxalobacter formigenes. And this little dude breaks down oxal- oxalic acid. Um, which you know is in high amounts in foods like rhubarb and spinach and silver beet and so forth, and it binds to calcium and stops it being absorbed. Well, if you've got a, a, a nice little load of oxalobacter, uh, oxalobacter formigenes in your gut, it breaks down the the oxalic acid, and you know therefore you're you're not going to absorb it. You're not going to get kidney stones from the, that are oxalate stones, and mm-hmm. and you're also um, going to be able to absorb your calcium better. But knock out your oxalobacter um, with a with a good dose of antibiotics. And now people are going to be at higher risk of, of, for instance, kidney stones, as well as not being able to absorb calcium as well from oxalate rich foods. So uh, it's, it's like, obviously, there's a time and a place for antibiotics, right? I'm not going to tell anyone to avoid antibiotics if they've got, I don't know, bacterial meningitis, or, or they've got toxoplasmosis because a feral cat bit them, like in a case like that, for God's sake, take the antibiotics. But if it's your, if it's you know your kid has a middle ear infection, um, it, it's rarely indicated. Antibiotics are rarely indicated in that case. If your kid has tonsillitis, more often than not, it's viral, not bacterial. Yeah, absolutely. And if, yeah, absolutely. And if you go to the doctor with an upper respiratory tract infection and your doctor prescribes antibiotics, run away. <laughs> Like change doctors, you know that's uh, that's just not right. That should not be done anymore. Uh, we're running out of antibiotics. You know the WHO has has basically you know uh, said that that we're, we're we're now entering the post antibiotic era. Um, overuse of these antibiotics is having catastrophic effects. And then like apart from people taking them because they were prescribed by the doctor, the other thing is of course they're eating them. Because they're, these antibiotics are given to dairy cows and they're given to factory farmed chickens and, and, and pigs and um, they're in the fish. High levels of antibiotics in the factory farmed fish. So the whole food supply is just riddled with antibiotics. And, you know, if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, apart from all the other good things you're doing for your gut microbiota, you're also not dosing them up with antibiotics every day. Um, you mentioned a couple of times there um, people that have been taking antibiotics potentially more than one course could go on to develop issues like, uh, you know, 
candida and thrush and things like that. What are your mm. thoughts on the um, candida diets that people are often put on where they're avoiding fruit, they're avoiding whole grains, they're avoiding all of these kind of high fibre foods because of the, I'm doing air quotes now, you can't see, um, the sugar <laughs> in the food. They want, make me want to stick a fork in my own eye. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness, anti-candida diets. You know, this was this was the thing back when I was in naturopathic college in in the 90s. This was all the rage, you know, candida was was the cause of everything. Right? It was just one of those trendy diagnoses. You know, got um, got fatigue, you must have candida. You know, um, got acne, oh I bet it's I bet it's your candida. I'm like this doesn't really make any sense. It didn't make sense then, it doesn't make sense now. So so, okay, the, the Canada albicans, the, the thrush organism, thrives when the gut bacteria that normally keep it in check have been knocked out by, by you know, some, uh, some influence such as antibiotics. So the, the notion that we should be trying to starve uh, candida albicans by not consuming any any sugar is is just a complete nonsense. Um, what we need to do is actually feed the bacteria that keep candida under check uh, by but again basically by by producing all of these acids like lactic acid and butyric acid and acetic acid. And what do those bacteria eat? They eat plant foods. So we, you know, people who, who've got a, a, a candida overgrowth need to be consuming fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes. And if, if they've got a really severe fungal overgrowth, they will probably have to use some kind of, of antifungal agent to knock that right down. It's it, 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 it's not very often that a person with a really serious fungal overgrowth can deal with that with, with diet alone. But in a case like that, what you're going to be doing is, is using that antifungal treatment, but then feeding the bacteria, which will keep candida uh, in check once you've actually knocked the numbers down with an antifungal agent, but certainly not avoiding all fruit and, and, and grains and whatever the heck else because, oh, you, you know, the other thing that I absolutely cracks me up with that, Emma, is um, people who are put on these anti-candida diets are told they also need to avoid um, mushrooms and yes. any <laughs> other of, of yeast. Like, how does that even make sense? It, it, it's, it's ridiculous. You know, candida is a fungus. It doesn't eat other fungi. In <laughs> fact, fungi are competitive with each other, just like bacteria are competitive with each other. So mushrooms, many, many mushrooms actually have antifungal agents that kill candida. So if you've got a thrush overgrowth, go and eat your mushies. <laughs> Yeah, there's a there's a whole lot of nonsense that gets spruiked about in the in the health arena and and I just find it so frustrating, so incredibly frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> and now with social media it's like holding up a megaphone to those people's mouths and they can reach a hell of a lot more people. So yeah. And definitely yeah. frustrating. They can. They just amplify their message. It, it it seems to me that the more ludicrous the message, the 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 the, the more widely it gets disseminated. There's there's some sort of weird law going oh, it's on there. Debate, isn't like, it? Yeah. <laughs> well, it is. It is absolutely. It is. Yeah. All right. So we've talked about um, how important the gut is for obviously for bowel cancer, for things like IBS and IBD, um, but I know that um, you're in this space very much, so talk to us a little bit about how your gut health can actually affect other conditions like, um, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and your mood as well. Oh my goodness! Yeah, this this is this is just an endlessly fascinating area of the science, and and again, um, pr a pretty new area of research. So uh, here, here's what we know at this point. Or, you, you mentioned autoimmune diseases, things like rheumatoid arthritis, and the necessary preconditions for autoimmune disease are, are firstly a genetic predisposition. And that's that's just one of those things where, you know, unfortunately, if you've got that, you're stuck with it. Sorry about that. But the, the next precondition is, is dysbiosis. And very closely related to that, uh, abnormal gut permeability. Mm. 
And in in the case of uh, type 1 diabetes, which is increasing at, at, at an alarming rate, I mean, type 2 diabetes is, is skyrocketing as well. But the incidence of type 1 diabetes is, is really increasing rapidly. And because... Um, I, because there is such a strong genetic risk basis for type 1 diabetes, there was a, a very, very interesting research project that was done where, where children whose sibling had been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes were, were, were followed up by researchers and specifically they did serial stool samples on these kids. And what was discovered was that there were marked changes in their gut microbiota that preceded the development of autoimmunity in these kids um, by by several months. So in other words, they were tracking these kids over time. They were monitoring stool samples and they were also checking for their blood levels of the basically of, of the uh, the antibodies that that destroy the beta cells so you know with type 1 diabetes you've got these antibodies so your own immune system is basically attacking and murdering your pancreas preventing it from being able to release uh, insulin so the changes in these kids gut microbiota preceded the development of autoimmunity as i say by by several months and that's really interesting. So something is happening in these kids' guts, in, in the composition of, of their gut microbiota. Now, the after the gut microbiota have, have altered, that actually alters the permeability of the gut. So, you know, people bandy the term leaky gut around. And what is meant by that is that, the, that there are substances that are meant to stay within the gut and, and not ever get through the gut wall and into the bloodstream or into the lymphatic system and therefore become, you know, part of part of the person's body. But if gut permeability is is altered, these substances can actually slip through that gut wall, get into the bloodstream, get into the lymphatic system, and then the immune system detects these substances and does what an immune system is supposed to do. It attacks them and attacks them by mounting an inflammatory response. So this is how autoimmunity works. You, you've got um, uh, an alteration in, in gut bacteria, the um, gut wall becomes more permeable, and then components of those bacteria, particularly a component called endotoxin, which is actually a structural component of the cell wall of certain types of bacteria that gets into the bloodstream and trips off the immune system. Um, endotoxin is actually the strongest spur of inflammatory activity that we know of. And uh, so, so you get this whole kind of inflammatory cascade. Um, in the case of a person with autoimmune predisposition, the immune system can start making antibodies against various bacteria and, and, and their byproducts. And those antibodies bodies might end up cross-reacting with with a person's tissue so in other words you know their, their immune system while it's hunting for for bugs ends up actually producing these antibodies that, that attack their their joint tissue or their thyroid tissue or their nervous system tissue and uh, I, I mentioned the absorption of endotoxin which occurs in abnormal amounts when when the gut permeability is altered well th this is the big link with depression because people with with um, chronic depression or, or with you know clinical depression have been found to have higher levels of inflammatory markers in their general circulation and also in their in in their in their brain circulation. So you know inflammatory substances like endotoxin from bacteria can get into the brain, can cross the blood brain barrier, and essentially cause inflammation in the brain. And the experience that a person with an inflamed brain has is called depression. <laughs> it's like if you think about how you feel when you're crook, um, when you when you get the lurgy and you've you're you're running a fever and you know you lose your appetite and you feel really sleepy and you don't want to socialize and you don't have any motivation to do anything. Um, there's a very imaginative name for that set of symptoms. It's called sick syndrome. They're up all night thinking of that. Um, so that 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 sick syndrome is actually due to an inflammatory activity that's actually mounted by the nervous system, and one of the one of the triggers for that is endotoxin. So depression is like a bad case of sick syndrome that just goes on and on and on and on, rather than just you know like the three or four days when you're fighting off the flu and you and you feel like hell. Mm -hmm. 
so one of the one of the ways that our our friendly gut bacteria protect us against uh, protect us against this whole catalog of woes is is um, when we are eating our plants we're eating our our high fiber foods our foods with resistant starch our polyphenols and so forth the our bacteria make uh, butyrate butyrate's a short chain fatty acid and butyrate is anti-inflammatory in the gut itself but it, it, it's uh, it's actually absorbed through the colon wall and it's this, it, it is a systemic anti-inflammatory it has an anti-inflammatory activity all over the body including in the brain butyrate is actually used by the small intestine cells to to heal them up when that when the gut walls become leaky uh, Butyrate is butyrate stimulates the release of of, of brain derived neurotrophic factor BDNF. Um, neurologists call this miracle grow for the brain. BDNF causes new brain cells to be born and new connections to be made between existing brain cells. So in other words, crucial for for learning and the laying down of memory. Um, I mean, butyrate is is just the most amazing and remarkable substance. And again, supplement manufacturers have tried to get in on the act by by you know selling butyrate supplements. Like, why bother? Your gut bacteria will make it for you for free if you just feed just them eat the food. food. <laughs> just eat the food. You get the whole lot going on down there in your gut. It's it's so simple. It's so crazy simple. So, yeah, our gut bacteria, one of the other short-chain fatty acids that our gut bacteria make is, is, is called propionate. And uh, the most interesting study that I've read on, on propionate, this is an absolute doozy. Um, what they did in this one is, is put people in uh, functional MRI scanners and um, – uh, measure the the activation of various parts of the brain, right? So so if if someone shows you a photo of some you know delectable looking food that's really energy dense, particular areas of your brain, the reward center in your brain will light up like a Christmas tree. It's like your brain saying, mmm, cheesecake, you know. <laughs> it's like in The Simpsons when when that when that um, donut appears in 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 Homer's brain. <laughs> 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 that is actually a thing. <laughs> but it's not the donut appearing in the brain. It's particular brain regions going, wow, wacko, look at that. I'm I'm pretty excited about that. So what was done in this experiment is they showed people these pictures of, of you know, cheesecake and chocolate, chocolate um, bars of chocolate and all this sort of stuff, like really high energy stuff that, that gets the reward center pretty excited. And then they infused their colons with, with propionate at the same concentration you would get if your gut bacteria actually making it for you and they showed these people pictures of the the food once again and their reward centers in their brain showed much less interest in it they didn't light up to nearly the same degree and then they let them loose on an all-you-can-eat buffet and they actually ate substantially less um after they'd been infused with propionate than when they were let loose on the on the all-you-can-eat buffet without the propionate so not only do people's brains get a lot less into it, you know, in, in, in into junky looking food, um, when when they have levels of this propionate, which again is made by your gut bacteria when you eat a high fiber diet, but they actually do eat less. It's not just that, that they're less excited about the food, they they do eat measurably less. And I think this accounts for, you know, what you and I have, have, have observed, Emma, in practice. I'm sure you've seen it too, Ben, that um, once you get people on a really healthy diet, they, rather than living their whole lives going, oh, I must stay away from the cheesecake, oh, it's so hard, they actually just lose their taste for it. It, it. It's just not that exciting anymore. And that's a really cool thing. People don't always believe you, of course, at the outset. Um, they don't always believe that that will happen, but almost universally that does happen where the food is just, let, you know, that, that kind of junky, hyper-palatable, ultra-processed food becomes less and less appealing the, the more um, healthy food people are eating, particularly the, the, the healthy high-fiber food. Yeah. I grew up hating vegetables. I would actually vomit if someone tried to feed me pumpkin. I basically lived on cheese sandwiches when I was little, unfortunately. <laughs> but, you know, if I can do it, <laughs> anyone can. 
Isn't that funny? I had a pathological aversion to pumpkin too when I was growing up, and I just love the stuff now. Oh, oh it's one of my pumpkin. favorite veggies. Pumpkin. Absolutely. Mine too. Mine too. I, I'm a fan of the pumpkin, and I, I yeah. Um, my my best friend and I actually bonded over our mutual loathing of pumpkin when I was in high school. I remember it distinctly. <laughs> I think it's to do a lot with, you know, the palate changing and moving away from a dependency of so much sodium, so much fat, um, even even the refined sugars. You know, I mean, just a, a, the unhealthy vegan vegetarian or even just a, a typical omnivore diet, uh, omnivorous diet, you know, it's it's what the palate wants. And, and to be fair, pumpkin, meh. But now... You know, we we. Ben, what are you saying? <laughs> but now, pumpkin. You know, you we've cleaned our palate. We've learned the 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 beauty of spices and 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 combining other beautiful vegetables and 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 legumes and so on. That pumpkin, all of it, just like with so many other vegetables that I used to loathe as well. It's now it's it's funny. A lot of food that I absolutely hated. <laughs> it's a strong word. I now what I eat almost every day. My mum can't believe it. Um, so it's certainly, I think, <laughs> yeah. a, a lot to do with, with um, you know, what we're grown to, uh, what we become accustomed to, to, to wanting to eat, yes. what, what hits I, our I sensories. Compl- I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is interesting, though, just how big of a role changes in bacterial composition make in our in our food preferences yeah. though so yeah. i i agree with you like there's a human component of this that has to do with um, our, our own palate like our own sense of taste and smell and so forth but as it turns out our gut bacteria actually influence in a sense the reward calculations that our brains are making about that as well and no one knows at this point like what what's the split is it 50 50 you know 50% human palate changes, 50% gut bacteria directing your preferences, or is it 80, 20, or 70? Like, no one mm-hmm. knows. I'm, I'm not sure if we'll ever know, but certainly our gut bacteria are playing a role in in those uh, changes in our food preference. It, it's essentially mm-hmm. like they're clamoring to get the foods that, that they're going to thrive on. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got a bunch of broccoli and pumpkin munching bacteria down there, and, and so they make me excited when I see pumpkin at the shops. <laughs> Robin, um, you uh, looking at the time, and we 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 can certainly carry on all afternoon. But um, you know, we don't we don't want to keep you. Uh, you know, um, you 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 you've truly shown what an absolute. I think Emma mentioned this right at the beginning of the show so long ago um, that you're a, a an absolute walking encyclopedia when it comes to the world of microbiome. And who knew how fascinating and uh, you know this topic is and and you've brought so much passion to this. And um, you know the term gut health is thrown around a lot. Uh, you know when bombarded with a lot of products that contain probiotics and you need to buy this or consume that, drink this because it's good for you. But you know you've brought you've exp- you've shown what this how much the simplicity of eating a varied whole food plant-based diet you know aiming for 30 plus different food types is all it requires you know to 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 nail the majority of it so thank you so much for bringing your passion to this um opening our eyes um i think there were a lot of phases where i've probably set a record of being so quiet i didn't go anywhere i was just I was just blown away. I was blown away and just You've so done much... the impossible, Robin. You've silenced that. <laughs> but you know, there's so much to take in and it's it is fascinating. Is. I really I really share that passion of yours and um thank you for making you know, doing this in a way that I hope our listeners agree that just makes so much sense. And can I just really quickly say, um, this is a this is a very deep um, topic. We could have talked about so much more. So for anyone that is actually interested, please do check out Robin's website. Um, she runs an empowered ed health and nutrition education program. Um, phenomenal. This lady is just such a wealth of information. So please do make sure you check her website out. We'll put the um, link in the show notes, Robin. But yes, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to to nerd out on one of my favourite <laughs> subjects, and I I do hope I haven't put your listeners to sleep. I hope I've in, I've inspired them with some of the some of the the fascination that I have for the little critters that that live down there. And yeah, folks, eat your fruits, veggies, whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices. That's what you need to have a healthy gut. 
And your pumpkin, Ben. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Definitely pumpkin. No, no, for sure. No, thank you, Robert, again. Thank you so much. It's, it's been an absolute delight. Pleasure's all mine. Thank you for listening to the Lentil Intervention Podcast. If you found this interesting, make sure you subscribe and share it with your friends. 